You remember that old commercial? Ernest and Julio Gallo said that they would sell no wine before its time. They understood that there was a premium to the taste when the grapes were ripened and fermented to the right point where it gave a certain vibrancy to the vino. Yes, timing matters. Even the Bible says in the book of, of the Songs of Solomon that one ought not awaken time, awaken, awaken love before its time. And then the writer of the sapential book of Proverbs says that there's a time and a season for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to cry and a time to shout. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Timing is important to success. And if you us the way and give us an obedient heart to do all that you would have us do as we worship you in truth and in spirit. And we say amen in the name of our Lord and Jesus and our Savior Christ. Amen. This is Advent. This is Christmas. <laughs> At the time of we have passed through a time of Advent where we celebrated love, hope, joy, and peace. And now we light the center candle, which represent the fact that our Savior is in the world Amen. and that we have great anticipation and hope now because he is alive. He is with us, Emmanuel, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. So let us do now all that we can to let God know that we appreciate his great love. We're going to sing, hark the herald angels sing, and you can see it on the screens. May God be with you.
Amen. Glory to the newborn king. Our scripture reading this morning will be from the book of Matthew, fifth chapter, starting at the 13th and concluding at the 16th verse. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. When you found it, please say amen. You'll see them on the screen and you'll also, in your Bible or the Pew Bible, let us read together. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Glory be to God.
of peace. Oh, Jesus, and the light of the world. Oh, hey, the sun of righteousness. Oh, Jesus, the light of the world. Ooh, oh, walk in the light, in the, light. In the, light. the beautiful light. Jesus, Jesus, the light of the world, the beautiful light. Before we welcome our guests, I failed to mention the fact that Children's Church has started. So some of those youngsters here are invited to Children's Church, and one of the ushers will make sure that you get to the appropriate place. Children's ch Church is now in session. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful sight. As we continue in worship, we want to welcome our guests. So if this is your first time that you're visiting with us here at Mount Olive, we ask that you would stand so that we can recognize your face in the place. If you're a returning guest, we ask that you would stand so that we would be able to welcome you. Amen. 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 On behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. James E. Victor Jr., and all of the ministerial staff, the ushers, and the diaconate, we welcome in every member of Mount Olive. We know that you had an opportunity to worship elsewhere, and we are blessed by your presence here today. We also say that if you're looking for a church home, we ask that you would consider Mount Olive. We also want to welcome our online guests who are visiting with us over the internet. We say to you that if you're going to be in the Washington, D.C. area, we would ask that you would come and worship with us in person. Our ushers are giving you a little packet of information, and in that 
packet. We're asking for just some brief contact information so that we can stay in contact with you. We want to make sure that your worship experience here is one that is memorable, and if we can enhance it, we want to be able to do that. Having said that, Mount Olive, let us stand and meet and greet our guests as we greet one another. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. What a joyous task it is to be a part of this Christmas story that all of us ought to want to share with others. We are so delighted to see all of you here today, and we are also delighted to see Brother Elijah Crawford, who went away here as a deacon, but he comes back now as a preacher of the gospel. So we thank God for his. And so if you'd like, you can join us up here now. If you want to sit with the brethren and the sister, and that's your prerogative. But God has promoted you, so you can come on up a little higher <laughs> if you choose. <laughs> Amen. Right. Now, he is now a Methodist, I believe. But I'm still a Baptist preacher, so if he comes up here, that means I may use him for something. All right. So you better be ready. That's my subtle way of letting you know you better be ready. Amen. We come now to worship God with the giving of our gifts, just as the Magi did when they found the Savior in his home. They brought to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We bring God our best gift today as he is our greatest gift from God. Now we give faithfully, we give with the generosity of heart and spirit, for God loves a cheerful giver. So ushers come forward now as we receive the people's gifts unto the Lord for all of his goodness. Deacon Green is going to pray, and then we will hear announcements for this faith community. Holy and glorious Father, God, we come to thee this morning with joy and grace on our mind. We thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. As we gracefully, graciously, graciously return to you the gift that you had given us, O oh gracious Lord, we cheerfully give it back to you without love and affection. We bless the gift and we thank you, O oh gracious Lord. We pray that it may be used for the uplifting of your kingdom here on earth. We ask these blessings in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have heard the announcements for this faith community for this week. Let us govern ourselves accordingly. As you know, this is the last Sunday in the month of December, the last Sunday in this year. And this is also the last opportunity, the opportunity we have to give to aid our brothers and sisters who have been flooded out in South Carolina. And so we'll ask that our ushers to come forward. Let us give generously. Let us give as God has prospered us as we help others during this Christmas season. Erect resurrection centers where new hope can be vitalized and that they can get a leg up on life again. Whatever you give is appreciated. It is above your normal tithe and offering, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred, or a thousand. No amount is too great. No amount is too small. For all of it will be pooled together, and we will send our donation to the Progressive National Baptist Convention, where we will, in partnership with Lot Carey and the National Baptist Convention USA, begin to erect resurrection centers. So let us pray in advance for what God is doing. God, we thank you for blessings, and we thank you for allowing us to be a blessing in the life of someone else. While these are but mere tokens of U.S. currency, we also know that they are expressions, dynamic expressions of love. For we give, dear God, without any expectation of return. We only want to see our neighbor prosper. So now as we give, we give some in abundance, some from sacrifice. But regardless, we still give. 
Now we thank you for these gifts that are blessings from your people to bless your people in other places. Help us now, dear God, and we pray that what we give would be blessed and multiplied just as you took on a day of scarcity, two fish and five loaves of bread with a multitude before you, with gratitude, it became more. So we are grateful for the little that we have now we trust you to turn it into the vastness of uh, your immeasurable kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray with thanks. Amen. What child is this? Who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch her Shepherds, God, and angels see. Haste, haste to bring him love, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. Be the king of kings, salvation ring, let love be.
don't hear me. Glory. I think I'll just say it again. Glory to the new born king. That's better than a hoverboard or a stocking stuffer. That's, that's better than a new coat or a new pair of shoes. Glory to the newborn king. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for a newborn king, one who supplants every normal entity of power and oppression. Lord, we thank you that the slave has become our brother and he breaks every chain. Lord, we pray now that as we revel in the establishment of your kingdom, that we would become good ambassadors, people who can share goodwill and good news, and who embody the fact that the king is among us. So now, God, we pray that as we attempt to unfold the sacred text, that you would be in our listening and be in our preaching, but most importantly, be in our being, dear God, to animate the word of truth. We ask these blessings now in the word made flesh who dwelt among us and we beheld him as the only begotten son full of grace and truth. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Let me direct your attention to the second chapter of the gospel according to Luke the first seven verses as we wrap up this series on Mary. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. All of you who can stand and will, let us rise to our feet to give reverence to the word of God as we consider our sermonic text today. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. The text reads thusly. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Thus ends the reading. Amen. I want to put a tag on this text and talk from the subject, it's that time. It's that time. Beloved, a few weeks ago I came home from a long night of church and discovered that Vanessa had bought a can of white macadamia nuts. They were just lying there on the counter and I said to myself when I spied those gems, it would be a wonderful way to get into the holiday spirit by baking some white macadamia nut cookies. And as I had never baked white macadamia nut cookies before, I went online and searched out what I thought was a good recipe and I followed it to the T. I dotted every I and crossed every T to make what I thought would be a good cookie so that we could get into a festive holiday mood. I followed the recipe, the batter came out, I put the cookies in the oven as instructed. I set my timer, but when the timer expired, 
I looked at the cookies and could tell they were not quite done. They needed a little longer time in the oven to complete the process. And there and then it dawned on me a valuable lesson of life that in order to bring enterprises to a viable completion, timing is a critical element. Had I taken the cookies out too soon, they would have remained in a gooey, unfinished state. But had I left them in too long, they would have been crispy and burnt, and their natural flavor would have been lost to a taste of being burned. It was at the right time that the cookie came to completion. And beloved, life experiences and even the Bible bear out the importance of good timing. Timing is critical for success. Timing is essential for uh, bringing to completion any undertaken enterprise. In football, there is what's called a timing pattern. Where the receiver has to get to a certain spot and the quarterback is throwing to the spot before the receiver gets there. Any interruption or disruption in either the quarterback or the receiver's timing disrupts the whole play. You remember that old commercial? Ernest and Julio Gallo said that they would sell no wine before it's time. They understood that there was a premium to the taste when the grapes were ripened and fermented to the right point where it gave a certain vibrancy to the vino. Yes, timing matters. Even the Bible says in the book of, of the Songs of Solomon that one ought not awaken time, awaken, awaken love before it's time. And then the writer of the sapential book of Proverbs says that there's a time and a season for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to cry and a time to shout. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Timing is important to success. And if you dare look at your life, I, I guarantee you that you will discover that there were missed opportunities because you did not recognize the time. Timing is critical to success, and living by a sense of good timing can always be of value and benefit to us. It is a general rule of thumb that ought not be overlooked, and it is a truth that can guide all of us except for one, I think, notable exception. Timing really doesn't matter when it comes to babies. Babies are notorious for coming when they want to. Very seldom do babies arrive on their expected due date. Some babies come early, some come late, but seldom do they come when they are forecasted to come. And because babies seem to have a mind of their own, they often compel or propel their parents into a tizzy because it's never quite the right time. Whether it's three o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the afternoon, it's never quite the right time. And that's what we find operating here in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It's not really the right time. The Bible says that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be registered for taxation purposes. And so Joseph uproots the family from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's not really the right time to have a baby. The taxes are too high. The world political scene is unstable. 
it's not the right time to have a baby because they have yet to be married. It's not a right time because they're in transition. It's an awkward time because there's no real room for them in the end. Had, the, had we had an idea of the idyllic, Mary would have been in a birthing room with an appropriate midwife to help bring forth her child. But no, there's no room in an inn, no midwife, no real crib. A feeding trough will house our Lord. It's just not on the surface the right time. But the Bible says that when the time came for her to deliver, she brought forth her firstborn. Beloved, I need to put you on notice that when we look around, we often conceive that God is at work in our lives to bring forth unique, spectacular things, things of great beauty, things of great value, things that will bless others and give glory to God, but it's often never the right time. You wanted to go back to school, but you said to yourself, it's not the right time. We've got other responsibilities for the family, and the money is just not right right now. It's not the right time. You wanted to venture off into a new business, but when you looked at the instability of the economy, you said it's not the right time. And even some of us will say we want to get right with God and join church, but when we look at the chaos in our lives, the response is, it's just not the right time. Often we want things laid out and neatly ordered in order to think that it is the right time. But I'm here to tell you that when God is ready to give the birth to those things that he has impregnated you with, your circumstances are never a prohibitive factor to what God wants to do. Uh, you can give birth when the circumstances are not right. You can produce when it's not the optimum time. You can give birth to great ideas and great works even though it's, in, it's an inopportune moment. Most of the time we say it's not the right time because it's not really a matter of timing, it's a matter of convenience. When God wants to do something with your life, it's an inconvenience that we're just not quite ready to deal with, not quite ready to put up with, not quite ready to manage, and therefore we say it's not the right time. But I need to tell you, God doesn't work on our time. God doesn't work on our schedules. God doesn't look at our clocks. God operates not by time, but by eternity. And when eternity says it's time, then it's time. And beloved, our ancestors used to say all the time that God is a time God. In other words, he may come at inconvenient moments, but whenever God shows up, it's the right time. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. He, he may not come when you're expecting, but he's always on time. He may not come when you would like for him to come, but praise be to God. He's always on time. God is not bound to any construct of chronology, but God operates as God chooses. And the Bible says that when it was time for her to deliver. And so then, since we have this perplexity here, this problem at hand, many of us are asking, since God wants to birth something in me that's grand and significant, but it's an inconvenient moment, when do, how do I know when the right time is. How do I know 
when it's time to give birth? How do I know when it's time to venture out beyond my comfort zone and do that new thing that needs to be done? How do I know? Well, when we look at this passage, we see that we know and understand it's the right time when circumstances conspire to put us on God's time. You, you see, beloved, uh, the ancient, ancient people had two understandings of time. One was chronos or chronotic time. That's calibrated time. That's measurable time. That's time that's governed by seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years and decades and centuries and millennia. But then there is chirotic time. Time that's not measured by a watch, but measured when God shows up and wants to do something spectacular in the lives of his people. And there are times when your experiences conspire to bring you to the recognition that it's not a chronotic moment, but it's a chirotic moment. Times happen when, you, when things rush together and you recognize I'm standing here on holy ground. There are times when, when you, you, you missed a phone call, but you went somewhere, you went to the store anyway. And when you went to the store, you discovered that the person that you had been thinking about and missed talking was right at the store. That's a chirotic moment. And beloved, when we look at our lives, God is moving and orchestrating because he wants to do something spectacular in our lives. There are times when the junk in your life con comes together in a confluence to help you understand God is trying to do something here. You know it's the right time when God shows up. That's what Mary and Martha discovered. They sent an urgent plea to Jesus one day because their sick brother Lazarus was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And they wanted Jesus to come immediately, urgently, post haste. But Jesus took his own sweet time. And when he got there, they said he was too late. But Jesus said to them, I'm not too late, I'm right on time. Because whenever I show up, there's always the opportunity for something to go down. And, and beloved, when you can recognize that God is at work in the moment, it's a time to give birth. Many of us miss the moment because we don't have the right frameworks of reference. We're looking at clocks rather than looking at the presence of the living God. Can I help you? Y'all are like this one. I don't particularly like this illustration, but y'all are like this. Yesterday, your Redskins won. They won a division championship under the leadership of Kirk Cousins. Now, if you look back two years ago, Cousins was an unheralded draft pick. I think around the fourth round, under the shadow of Washington's savior, RG3, who hadn't been able to produce anything. But this brother kept on working, kept on learning the system, kept on working, kept on going to practice, never demeaned the star. And can I pause here? Some of y'all will never get ahead as long as you're demeaning the one that's supposed to be in the position that you really want. He never demeaned the star. He just kept working. And then his time came. 
And because he had worked so hard and God was in the moment, now he's the fourth quarterback in your franchise history to, fall, to throw 4,000 yards in a season. It's because you got to recognize when your time is. And you can't be jealous of when other folk are getting blessed, when other folks are shining, when other folks' contracts are getting extended. But if you just do your best with what you have, God will open up the door of opportunity for you to shine. But it's got to be at on God's time. You know it's the right time, beloved, when you are filled with expectation. The book here says that she was expecting a child. And while they were there, notice the sequence. She was expecting, then she delivered. Most of us want the delivery, then the expectation. But the text says she was expecting then when she got to where God needed her to be to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus would be of the divinic line and kingdom, then she gave birth. And many of us never recognize the time because we, have, we suffer from low expectations. Many of us never get the blessing, never get the breakthrough, never get the deliverance because we simply don't expect anything from God. But every now and then, if you are a child of God, you ought to expect God to do something. When you look at the mess in your life, the chaos in your constructs, the dirtiness in your situations, every now and then, you ought to just expect God for your breakthrough. Expect God for your deliverance. Expect God for your healing. Expect God to do something in the situation. And beloved, sometimes you just got to step back and say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to work it out, but I believe you're going to work it out. I don't know how you're going to turn it around, but I believe you're going to turn it around. I don't know how you're going to deal with this diagnosis, but I'm expecting the healer to show up. I don't know how you're going to keep me when I got no job, but I'm expecting the provider to show up. I don't know how you're going to deliver me, but I'm expecting the deliverer to show up. When you are filled with expectation, you know it's time to give birth. How sad it is for the people of God to not really expect a whole lot from God. We can come to church Sunday after Sunday, hear the word week after week, study it for ourselves and in Bible study, and then leave never really expecting God to intervene. But baby, you just need to say, God, you got this. It's in your hands, and I'm expecting you to work it out. And when you get to a level of expectation and full of understanding that God can and will do something, then you know it's the right time. But many of us will have our dreams aborted by low expectations. Always expect something from the divine. That's where the mystery comes in. That's where the excitement comes in. That's where the energy comes in. You are not ever come to church thinking it's going to be like it was last Sunday. God is going to do something new this Sunday. And I come expecting to meet God, to do something about my condition. You've got to have a sense of expectation. And then finally, you know it's time to give birth. It's time when you can't stand the contractions any longer. The text says that when she reached Bethlehem, 
It became an unbearable experience. It was simply time. And contractions are a part of the birth experience. I shared with the earlier crowd this morning, I, I, I've seen childbirth. And therefore, I thank God I'm a man. That's a pain that I would never, ever want to experience. I give mad props to the sisters who have had children because they've gone through contractions. And contractions are the pains and the body's way of saying it's time to push. Something is about to break through. Something is about to happen because the body is going through contractions and pains and telling you it's time to give birth. You see, I've never had a baby, but I've gone through some pains to bring forth great things in my life. And I'm here to tell you, beloved, that whenever you're going through a struggle, whenever you got a pain, whenever you got a disappointment, a heartbreak, or a setback, it's really not just to hurt you. It's God's way of bringing something spectacular into your life. <laughs> Let me see if I can't make this thing plain. Joe Rance is a name you probably never heard of. Joe Rance was a young man who at the age, who was, who was brought into the world with a rather auspicious beginning. His mother came from good stock. His father was an intellectual man of great curiosity and the ability to tinker with things. And so they, his parents made a way for he and his brother in the world. And they were successful. Until at the age of four, Joe's mother died. And then Joe was whisked away to an aunt in the eastern part of the country that he had never known before. He stayed with her a few years, and then when his brother graduated from college, he went to live with his brother. And after the mother's death, the father checked out of reality and ran off to the Canadian woods. But when he got a toehold again on normalcy, he came back to Washington State where he opened up a business, built a new house, remarried, and brought back his younger son. Life seemed to be on an upward spiral once again until the house caught a fire at about the age of eight, and it burned down completely to which then the father had to drive all the way from Washington State to Montana to work in a mine where he was the chief engineer. It was cold, it was dingy, it was dirty, it was difficult. And the stepmother at the age at Joe's 10th birthday rejected him and put him out of the house. Father not being willing to just abandon his boy, made a deal with the local school teacher and the cook in the mining camp. So Joe could stay in the schoolhouse if he cut wood in the, in the evenings. And he could eat if he carried the trays of the miners and helped to cook. But the difficulty was the schoolhouse was on the top of the mountain and the kitchen was on the bottom of the mountain. So at 10 years old, every morning he had to get up and go to the bottom of the mountain and there carry heavy trays filled with miners plates and then once they had finished eating, remove the trays. This is 10 years old. And then he had to walk all the way up to the top of the mountain and chop wood and then go to school. And when school was over, he had to walk back down the mountain to serve the miners again. Every day from 10 to 18, he went up the mountain, chopped the wood, down the mountain, carried the tray. But at every descent and ascent of the mountain, Joe's muscles got stronger. And Joe's 
shoulders got broader and his biceps and his triceps became more muscular and his quadriceps got great strength from going up and down the mountain two times a day. And finally, when the 1936 Olympic trials came around, Joe Rantz made the Olympic team that would defeat fascism and Hitler in the Berlin games. But it was all because he had to go up and down the mountain. He had to experience great pain. He had to go through the difficult moments of life. He had to go through hell and high water. But at every time up the mountain and down the mountain, he got a little stronger till he became the perfect oarsman for an Olympic gold medal. And I'm here to tell you that every heartbreak, every tear, Every pain, every setback, every disappointment, every frustration that you've got to go through is just making you stronger to give birth to what God wants in your life. It's making you stronger till you got to say, push, I can't stand it any longer. Push, I can't deal with the difficulties. Push. I've got to give birth to what God has instilled and implanted in me. Every time you turn at night, it's just part of the labor process. Every time you wrestle with God, it's just part of the birthing process. Every time the world knocks you down to your knees and you dust yourself and get back up and try to live again, it's just getting you stronger for the birthing process. And when pain and opportunity collides, it's time to give birth. So baby, the next time you are experiencing your greatest pain, you ought to say, it's time. It's time to go back to school. It's time to start that business. It's time to venture out of my comfort zone. It's time to start a new relationship. It's time to be a better giver. It's time to be in a more effective servant. It's time to preach the gospel. It's time to honor God's calling in my life. When I'm going through my worst day, it's just part of the birthing process. So the text says that it was an inopportune time. It wasn't really a good time. Caesar Augustus was the emperor of the Roman Empire, the ruler of the known world, who was believed to have brought peace to the world. He was the initiator of what is known as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. But Luke says that this baby that's born and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a feeding trough as an unheralded king is the one that will reverse every sense of normalcy in the world. So peace didn't come by an emperor. It came by a baby in a manger. And he says that he would reverse not only notions of peace, but his birth in an inopportune time would reverse any sense of timing. This baby that's born in this manger is the one that knows how to turn things around and turn reality upside down on its head. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he turned some things around. I'm glad that the Christ knew how to supplant order and establish a kingdom that would have no end. I'm glad that he is the one that turned notions of power around so that the king doesn't come in purple, but it comes wrapped in rags, that the God of the universe 
is not born in a palace, but born in an animal stall. And that the king of glory was not laid in a crib, but he was laid down in a manger, a feeding trough. And I'm glad that he turned every sense of normalcy upside down, even time. So that time is now no longer a second, but I live by eternity. I no longer live by days and hours, but I'm trying to find my destiny. And because he came in a manger, a lowly manger, the greatest one is in the lowest place. I know now, and you ought to know now, that God will turn some things around. I'm glad that I can now delineate history. I can mark time in AD and BC, before Christ and after Christ. Before Christ, I was a wretch undone, but after Christ, I'm a king's kid. Before Christ, I was a lowly sinner, but after Christ, I'm a child of the Most High King. Before Christ, I was lost. But after Christ, he found me. Before Christ, I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within. Sinking to rise no more but after Christ he heard my despair and cry and from the waters he lifted me yeah, yeah. now safe am I I tell you is there anybody here with an after Christ picture all you gotta do is look at your life and you'll see what he did before and what you are after. No wonder the songwriter said, since Jesus came into my life, floods of joy all oh, my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus, since Jesus, since Jesus, since Jesus came into my life, I've got joy, unspeakable joy. I've got peace that passes understanding. I've got power that comes from on high. Yes, since Jesus came into my life, floods of joy. Oh, my soul. What a wonderful change. And my life has been wrought since Jesus. Has he ever come in your life? Has he ever made a change? Has he ever turned it around? Has he ever made a difference? Has he ever gotten you out of a bind? Somebody ought to praise him today. Because he's the God that'll turn your life around. Make a difference. In your life, if there's someone here today, if there is someone here today that he's made a difference, he's uprooted and overturned, given us a new sense of normalcy then I pray you choose to redeem the time wisely it's that time it's that time for you to come and surrender your life to the king of kings and the lord of lords it's your time to choose 
in this chirotic moment where God is abiding with us. His presence is bringing about opportunity for you to seize the moment. There is a phrase in Latin called carpe diem, which simply means seize the day. Take advantage of this present moment to yield your life to eternal life and to surrender time to your ultimate destiny. I'm not just talking about heaven, but I'm talking about what God wants to use you for. In a crazy mixed up world, cause what you got, God needs. And so does the world. Nobody can do it like you, no, nobody can tell it like you, nobody can say it like you, nobody can sing it like you. What you have, the world needs so choose wisely if there are any today that will choose Jesus we implore you to come he's made a wonderful difference in our lives and he's made a wonderful difference in your life whether you realize it or not Everything you've ever gone through, every hurt, every hardship was bringing you to a moment of destiny. So if you feel your destiny is unfolding or if you're in the middle of labor right now and you need a midwife to give birth to what God wants to do, then we invite you to come state your intention to become a part of the church and a part of the family of God. And we'll give assistance to you as you give birth to that special feature that God wants to bring into the world through you. If there are those today as the choir sings who want to come and unite with the church, you've never been baptized before, now is your opportunity. You'd like to unite with the Mount Olive Church Though you are a Christian by your letter or by your Christian experience, now is your opportunity. However you choose to come, by whatever means you uh, are using at your disposal, the most important thing is that you come and come to Jesus because he's made a wonderful difference in your life. If you're here, won't you come as the choir sings? We extend the invitation to Christian discipleship.